All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, um, and thank you for joining us on this webinar where we will be showcasing um, the work of our photographers um, um, through the virtual exhibition uh, titled COVID Through My Lens. My name is Musidi Mohele from the National Press Club, and I will, I will be facilitating this particular webinar. Um, at this point in time, I'd like to introduce Emmanuel. Emmanuel is from Street, and he will tell us about the partnership between Street and the National Press Club, which led to this particular webinar that we're currently having. Over to you, Emmanuel. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Emmanuel. I'm from Street. Uh, we're an online platform for photographers and writers. The, um, the purpose of the collaboration essentially was to showcase the works of photographers who are working professionally in the industry and people who are on just an everyday documenting the experience of you know, being in lockdown or the pandemic in general. And um, essentially what we're trying to do is um, bring the platform online uh, there's a lot that's been written about COVID-19 and um, the experience of seeing the images uh, in conjunction with the literature, we're hoping will, uh, you know, strengthen the conversation around um, the impact of COVID-19 and how our different experiences, uh, I guess, um, yeah, highlight uh, holistically what uh, it means you know to live in these times so um, essentially the exhibition is just to have a public conversation and um, yeah I'm, I'm excited to to see um, the works and uh, generally just listening to the narratives behind all the images Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, I will move over to introducing our photojournalist, starting with uh, Kim Ladbrook. Kim, if you can just wave to everybody while I read a um, little bit about yourself. So Kim is a senior correspondent photo and video for EP EPA Photos, uh, a major international news photo agency that's based in Johannesburg. Welcome, Kim. Um, Thank you so much. Jack Nellis. Jack is a citizen photojournalist and documentary photographer. Jack, can you just uh, wave to our viewers? Thank you. And also I have Alistair Russell. Alistair is a freelance uh, gen photojournalist currently working um, for the Sunday Times. Um, Alistair, if you can just wave to our viewers, please. Thank you. Um, at this point in time, I'm going to invite um, our photojournalist to take us through their work and uh, just explaining as well the story behind the photos, starting with Kim. Over to you, Kim. Thanks so much um, for having me and uh, really honored just to share my experiences um, to date. Um, you know, it's been sort of four and a half months, um, you know, since all of us photojournalists have been covering the story. And um, yeah, I think it's going to be, you know, a good couple of months or even years maybe covering the same story. So. I just presuming, sorry, technically that you're looking at my first image because I can't see on my iPhone. Um, is this the, the image of the funeral, Petri? Hello? Just give a second to get to it. Okay, no problem. Um, so while we're sort of doing that, I mean, I think my, you know, the first thing to say is that that I've been working for sort of 25 years now, and I really have never covered a story like this. Um, I, I think that the first thing that, that, that struck me when we went into lockdown was just the fact that this is basically an unseen enemy. I mean, I've, the virus, obviously you can't see. So, you know, I'm still finding that really difficult in terms of my coverage of the story. Um, you know, I've, I've covered sort of two civil wars and the invasion of Iraq um, you know, a lot of political violence after elections, so on and so forth. And of course, in that situation, um, you can literally physically see where the danger is and, 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 you know, how to protect yourself and how to sort of, you know, try and be as safe as possible. But I think what I'm finding the most stressful and difficult part of, of this journey for me is, is, you know, covering this unseen virus. Um, 
Ah, okay, I, yeah, I see that my one picture's up. So just before I start talking about this image, um, you know, it was obviously very difficult to find six or seven images that, that over four months of work. So what I've done is I've, I've chosen these images because the one approach I wanted to take to the story is to try and really personalize the story. Um, the other thing to, to sort of note is that in my agency, there's 200 staff photographers around the world. And in our context, and I suppose in most big news organizations and daily newspapers, of course, um, you know, this is the first story, certainly in my career, that the entire agency is covering at the same time. I mean, at one stage, 90% of our daily coverage of images, which is about 2000 a day was dedicated to only one story. So, um, which of course was, was the pandemic. So I also realized that I needed to personalize my images from South Africa to help them stand out a little bit. Um, so sort of going straight into this first picture, um, two, three weeks ago, I went, you know, purposely to the Karoo, um, to the Krafrenet area to try and also document and show the ravages of the pandemic in the, in the Karoo. Um, and through a local journalist, I heard about a local um, police commander um, who commanded the police station in Middleburg. Um, and uh, sort of one thing led to another. Um, and I managed to, to sort of get the widow and his two children, Andrew Leslie was the policeman, and asked them just to basically come to his graveside um, which they were gonna do on the Sunday. And so this is the first of my images and it's just really important for me that I portray the personal side of the COVID story. So this is the uh, image here, it's the Middleburg graveyard, which is Middleburg in the, in the middle of the Karoo. And um, you know, this is the family um, mourning the loss of, of their, you know, her husband and, their, and the two children's father. And so I don't know if we can move on to the next image. I think it's coming up. <laughs> so I'll start talking a little bit about the picture and before it comes up and, and the one thing that I noted, um, which was quite incredible in the first days of level five lockdown, I'm, you know, I'm based in Joburg and, and a lot of the time was working in downtown Joburg. And, you know, the one shocking aspect of, of lockdown was um, by default, you know, because there was no people in the city who are allowed to work there or travel into the city being level five, the first and only people that stood out for me were the drug addicts. I mean, literally for, for the entire level five, which I think if I can remember was about a month, the only people that I saw there were, were frontline workers, police, um, some ambulance crews and drug addicts. So, um, you know, that was really a major part of my coverage. And, and in this case, this is, Owen Barnard, the picture that I think you're looking at. Um, and, you know, myself and some colleagues were driving down a road and literally, you know, Owen walked into the street to ask us for food or for help. And this is where this portrait came from. Um, you know, so again, it's very personal. Um, in, the, in this case, I always try and take people's names. I try and make my images personal, um, you know, and I try not to as much as possible um, sort of, dehumanize the, my work, um, particularly in the pandemic. So that's a picture of, of you know, heroin addict in this case, Owen Barnard. Um, Kim, just sorry, we just have technical uh, problems. Can we just wait a bit okay. to just- I'm Yeah, just sure. To show them the picture. Um, so I'll just keep chatting while, you know, my pictures are coming up, but you know, that was the one sort of really stark um, byproduct of the lockdown uh, level five and then also a bit into level four but level five was quite radical yeah that's Owen um, you can see he's pretty strung out um, Petri we've already sort of moved to the next image which is in a refugee or homeless shelter should I say in Pretoria um, it's it's a press club image number three um, and this again you know yeah, um, Jacques would, uh, will know this place. I think he worked there quite a lot. Um, so this is a homeless shelter in Pretoria. And, um, you know, I found this, this actual picture quite difficult to get uh, because when I 
sort of arrived at the, the homeless shelter or the refugee camp, whatever phrase you want to use, um, which was on a sort of open rugby field. Um, you know, the minute I sort of got out of my car with cameras, you know, I wasn't greeted um, very nicely by most people. I think they just didn't want their pictures taken or I think many of them maybe um, uh, were legal immigrants. Maybe they certainly didn't want their pictures taken. And um, so I just saw this, this one man, Luanda, who was praying uh, next to his tent and just sort of went up and asked him, you know, can I do some pictures of a new, you? And he said, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, this is a picture of Luanda who's praying. And again, you know, just trying to make the story really personal um, and, and interviewing as many people as I can. So the picture's still not coming up. <laughs> Are you able to see the pictures or not? Hello? Him, not as yet, but perhaps okay. when the next picture to open up, perhaps you can share with us, um, I mean, the challenges you, you've mentioned yeah, that- Sure, no problem. Some of the pictures you, you actually captured while we're on stage five. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering that, uh, you know, obviously at the time, um, some people encountered a bit of a police brutality, you know, um, yeah. if found moving around. Did you perhaps encounter any of that? And what has been the experience as you were going about capturing some of these moments? Yeah, and um, so sort of police brutality, yeah, I actually did. I mean, the one day, you know, I was in downtown Joburg with sort of following a, you know, a crew of police who were enforcing the lockdown. And um, yeah, they were sort of uh, being sort of real forceful with some people, um, you know, using the back of their rifles to sort of push people around, um, being fairly forceful. But, you know, what I should say immediately is one other aspect of covering the, the virus, which has been incredible for me, um, is, is the positive um, aspect to the story. And, you know, I have met and photographed so many normal South Africans who have got off their asses and gone out there to help feed feeding schemes, to help homeless shelters. And it's been quite incredible for me to see that as much as it's such a difficult time for all of us and will continue to be, um, mm -hmm. and as much as in my opinion, government and local governments are doing as best they can, you know, it's also mm -hmm. up to the citizens, all of us to actually be part and parcel of this. You can't sort of blame the government or put it all in the government's hands in any country, not only South Africa. So, you know, as much as I saw a bit of, I wouldn't say police brutality, but um, heavy handedness, um, mm -hmm. you know, I was also very aware that every single one of those policemen, firemen, paramedics out there was also, also risking their lives. You know, it's uh, people, I think people forget that. I mean, everyone on the front line at the moment, and as we know, I'm sure that, that all of us know, I mean, the the infection rate is really rapidly rising and unfortunately with that the death rate too which is the next part of my story which are my coverage which i'm going to start next week um just getting back to that picture you're looking at this is sort of yes. a fairly classic um you know testing scene in, in alex township but this is very interesting for me because this is like this dirt soccer field um in alex and i distinctly remember um you know, 2010, doing a, a very different, beautiful sort of photo essay on 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 kids soccer on the same field. So for me, it was really quite um, of a strange experience to arrive there and see this entire field covered with people wanting to get tested and this whole pandemic testing scene in front of me. So you know, that was one thing to note from this picture. It was was pretty strange. Um, Petri, if you can go to the next picture, Press Club 5. Um, so yeah, while that's coming up, I think, you know, being a father of two and a husband, you know, my, my, obviously my main concern, and it continues to be all the time, every day I go out, is, is bringing the virus back to my family. And again, mm -hmm. just in my intro, the fact that this virus is completely invisible, um, 
you know, is, is, is I suppose the most, um, you know, stressful and um, brings the most anxiety to me in covering it. I just wish, you know, that it would be easier, but, you know, clearly it isn't. And, and, and as I said earlier, I mean, I think we end this for uh, till the end of the year, certainly. Um, yeah, so this, this picture is from downtown Joburg. It's a feeding scheme. And again, it's just one of those, those, those images that really pushes buttons in me because most of the, the people in that queue for food are drug addicts. And of course, mm -hmm. when you, you're on drugs and, and the only thing you're really concerned about is your next meal, um, you know, personal distancing and 1.5 meters between you means nothing. So, you know, that's why I included this picture. It's just because, you know, sort of in that level of society, and I'm not meaning that in a derogatory way, um, there are so many homeless people and so many unemployed. And I'm sure we know already seen, you know, the figures are astounding. There seems to be figures of 3 million um, more unemployed uh, South Africans since the start of the pandemic. So another point is that that's where a lot of my coverage has been, has been around um, the needy, the poor, the homeless for good reason, because I want to show that aspect of the story. Um, I think I'm doing a right time-wise. Um, Petri, then the next one is, you know, sort of uh, a man being arrested and uh, this picture got used quite widely. I mean, I don't think it's a great image, but it's just, you know, it's also that sort of moment where, um, you know, a man's walking down the street, it's in lockdown, and he basically chose the wrong moment to go wherever he is going because he wasn't going to the shops. This was in level five, by the way. And, um, you know, as I came around the corner with some Metro police, you know, they arrested him. And yeah, his life changed radically because of course there's a criminal record that goes with that and so on and so forth. Um, I think Petri, if you can go to my final image because I think, um, you know, this final image of mine um, of Vanner is sort of fairly um, um, indicative of, of the way I've been trying to cover the story. So it's National Press Club 8. Um, when I was in Littleton in Pretoria and I, I went to a, a homeless shelter that Jack had actually covered first, I think, um, I heard about a man living in his car under a tree and sort of was taken to the tree and found this incredible scene, um, sort of both visually and, and, and sort of socially. And there was this man that I've become sort of quite good friends with, I could say, and been in touch with since then. Um, and this is Vanner, um, you know, Vanner and his partner sort of live in a car and they, they have been since lockdown started. I mean, he's homeless, he doesn't have an income. And, you know, what amazed me still about Vanner is, you know, on the side of his car, he's got the South African flag and, you know, he's a very proud man and he reads books at night in his car, of course, and he relies on food handouts. And I think, you know, if, you know, in a couple of years, when I look back at, at covering the story, I think, you know, the story of Vanner and Vanessa, his partner, is sort of always going to stay with me because, um, you know, the story itself, the pandemic really um, showed me how impermanent life is and how, how much our lives can change in a heartbeat, all of us. I mean, all of our lives have changed radically. So um, I think in closing, you know, this is one of my stronger pictures from the sense that, you know, it tells such a, a potent story and, and this is Vanner and he's still in his car as far as I know. I was actually thinking of getting in touch with him next week. So, yeah, thanks for your time and, uh, you know, and the opportunity to show the pictures. So, yeah, um, thanks so much. Kim, uh, thank you so much for taking us through your work. I mean, this is a, such powerful way of storytelling using um Images. It actually shows us the other side that we don't normally get exposed to of what really went on um, uh, so far during the, the COVID period. Thank you for that. We'll come back to you. Um, at this point in time, I just want to give Jack Nellis the opportunity as well to just take us through his work and tell us uh, the stories behind the pictures. Oh, hi, guys. Um, I'm just going to I'm going to share my screen, so it'll probably be easier then you guys yeah, 
Give me a second. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, so I'm Jacques um, Nellis. I'm from The Citizen, uh, and I'm based in Pretoria, and I'm generally work in Pretoria. Um, this first picture is um, a picture from, uh, it was on the 29th of March, and it's this crowd of uh, people pushing and shoving each other at the Caledonian Stadium, where initially, uh, as soon as the lockdown started, they sort of moved all of the homeless people to Caledonian Stadium. And I'm not sure about the exact amount, but there were like more than a thousand people there that they'd moved and put into the same place all at once, which was kind of a little ironic because, you know, the people on the streets where they were kind of were by themselves, now they're all being put together and we're trying to prevent spreading this disease. But anyway, obviously the homeless people were put together and um, eventually they were moved to the separate different places. Um, but these guys were all like scuffling and fighting over food, which I just thought was like, uh, this was like the beginning of COVID and this is how we entering it, which I thought was a bit ironic. Um, yeah, so that's this picture. It was on the 29th of March. And then um, what happened to most of these guys, they were taken to the Caledonian Stadium were then split up uh, to different shelters across Pretoria. And this is one of the spaces they were taken to um, in Littleton at like this government building. And this dude, uh, Matthews Ramoka, uh, Rakom, Rakomane, um, he's like a garden, a part-time garden guy um, who's also homeless. Um, he was kind of happy to be around here because he was getting food, which kind of, you know, sort of showed to me that government for the first time um, has proactively been like feeding homeless people and put, um, helping homeless people out. Uh, a lot of homeless people are also uh, addicted to drugs and they offering them methadone and sort of helping them come clean during this time, which, uh, you know, government's not done this before at this scale and they were kind of forced to, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, I just don't want to kind of worry about seeing these people go back out onto the street again. Uh, after this is over. And some of them actually have. I've seen lots of them are back on the streets now. So that's kind of sad. But yeah. So yeah. Um, and then at the same time, not very long after, this was this was uh, around on the 13th of May, um, outside ca Railway Cafe where uh, in Centurion, where they have this cool place where they have this program, they're feeding people. Um, at the outside the cafe, there's this abandoned bunch of buildings, and in there live about 40 homeless people. And these guys weren't offered the same option as uh, the other guys that were found in the CBD and moved to places. These guys were just left there to live in these dilapidated homes. So these guys are busy doing drugs, and it's still something that's fairly very ex accessible. They can get it quite easily. There's about 40 of them there and like 20 of them um, are still using uh, every day and getting ways to make money to go get. And this was during level five of lockdown. So I thought that was quite crazy. And it's also just a stark contrast to the other homeless guys that are busy getting uh, methadone given to them by government to help them out. And um, yeah, this next picture, it's just a picture from a patrol uh, I went with the SANDF. It was kind of the first, one of the first days that I actually properly saw the SANDF. And this was on, uh, what was the date? This was uh, on 20, 20, what, first two, 21 days of lockdown. It was the first time I properly saw, like, went on a thing with the, with the SANDF. And we just patrolled through uh, Dipslet. And it sort of struck me that people at the time weren't really inside their homes. They were all walking around the street and the SANDF were just kind of driving around. And that's kind of what we did. That's all we did at the time. They didn't force anyone to do anything. They didn't arrest anyone. They did shout at a couple of people. And yeah, it wasn't very hectic. And it seemed like they weren't really enforcing anything. So they weren't really being very heavy handed. They were even nice because we got a flat at one point and then some of them helped us uh, fix the flat, <laughs> even though 
Uh, they weren't supposed to, the, the, the guys that helped us fix the flat weren't supposed to be open. Uh, the military dudes helped us out, I guess. And they got, they helped us get out of stuck being stuck in Dipsula. Um, but yeah, so I just thought it was a cool picture to include just to sort of, uh, I've never seen sort of Dipsula or a township kind of like this with like rows of military black mamba or what are these things are called mamba armored vehicles um, driving around. So yeah, that was a, I want to include that picture, show you guys. And then um, this picture, I just thought it was a nice picture of these guys that are in uh, um, Mama Lordy busy sanitizing uh, taxis and they were dressed up in these cool uniforms. And I just thought it was like sort of these taxis, not maybe so much this one, but uh, Quantum's more, but these taxis are traditionally South African taxis and it's just weird seeing this guy with this thing like he's looking like he's going to mars or something and he's busy cleaning spraying taxis in in mama lordy so it's just the stark different reality that uh has is happening around us every day that you just happen to walk upon and it's like we'll go find them every day um so i thought that was a cool picture and then um these guys uh are in uh the Moy Place. And in Moy Place, there's a where people were, went to go collect uh, their food parcels. There were there was like this insanely long queue. This queue was maybe like, I don't know, two kilometers or something at least. There was this really long queue. And in the front of the queue, the first like two, three hundred meters of the queue, everyone is social distance. The cops are there, people are ensuring their social distancing. And then the other 1.9 kilometers of the queue, uh, people are queued like this. And it's just this long queue of people squeezed together. Some of them having been there since like early in the morning um, to collect food parcels. And I just thought it was like, it was insane. And it made a lot, not a lot of sense because we're trying to social distance, but now people are actually literally every day gathering like very tightly together more than uh, they did before COVID. And I just thought that was, that was very, that was bad. That was awful, the situation that the people in White Plus have to queue like this just to get food. And then, um, so then I included this picture because this is from, uh, uh, this is, these were the guys in Olivenard Bosch. And uh, these guys had made a plan and they started sort of getting um, wheelbarrows and rocking up with their wheelbarrows and collecting the food and then delivering to people's homes, preventing like people having to all go queue there. These guys, you pay these guys like 20 bucks and they do that for you. And every day they'll go collect your food parcels for you and bring to your house, which I thought was like this great initiative that these people had undertaken um, instead of queuing the way they do in, uh, uh, like they did in Moit Plus. Um, yeah, these are just like, these are some of the pictures I've been shooting from earlier on in lockdown. And uh, well, thank you guys. Thank you, Jack. I, I mean, I'm captured by this uh, last, last picture in, in particular, because I don't think that's the site that we heard a lot about, you know, of how some of these guys were actually being entrepreneurial in the middle of um, um, a crisis, you know, um, coming up with solutions of how they can um, actually assist with social distancing and avoid longer queues than what they already were, but still ensuring that those in need of um, food donations are actually receiving them. Thank you so much. Um, Alistair, um, Alistair, as I mentioned, is a freelance journalist currently working for uh, the Sunday Times. Um, over to you, uh, Alistair. Um, how's it, guys? Good evening. How's it going? Um, just a slight correction. I'm not actually a, free, a, a freelance uh, a photographer. I work full-time full -time for the Sunday Times. I'm a staffer there. Um, but yeah, just, just to put it out there. Um, what, a, what a tough act to follow, um, really, with Kim Ludbrook, Sharp <laughs> Malice. Oh, dude. Both you guys are, are absolutely amazing. So thank you for putting me at the end. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Safer. Okay. safer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, but but thank you very much for putting me at the end. Uh, it's a this is a lovely platform for us to show work and 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 thanks very much to the press club. 
I'm going to uh, switch over to, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, so let me know when we do have a confirmation on that. Should come in the next few seconds. Okay, and can you see my work? We can. Yes. Okay, and just give me two seconds whilst I make this full screen. And can everyone see it on full screen? Yes. Okay, yes. fantastic. Okay, so I'm just going to um, talk about the work as we roll through. Okay, so the, the, the first image that um, I decided to show was an image that um, I felt sort of worked as a good opener. Um, and it's a good opener because it's, uh, it, works, it works well in the sense that it's a picture of people starting their day, um, of a, a process that's starting to happen. And this has very much become the new normal in terms of society. Um, this was a picture taken just before when people were setting up a, a feeding scheme in Soweto. We can see the Orlando Towers in the background. Um, and we can sort of see what sort of is happening now before setting these chairs so far apart would have been uh, completely strange but um sort of as an opening image it, it works quite well to show that you know now we're in this we're in the space where we need to think a bit about our space and think a bit about um having a bit of distance between people and uh, anyway so so what what later happened in this uh, in this scenario was that um there were thousands of people that had that had sort of all gathered around and formed lines all the way down and around and uh, down the streets but um sometimes it, it it really just helps to arrive a little bit early and and to see what's happening before people set up because you're able to then you're able then to to sort of make sense of 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 what's happening and be a bit quiet and 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 look at things as they unfold and uh, yeah so as an opener uh, opener um i'm i'm uh, yeah the, this this image for me um just tells a little bit about how we have to you know move forward we need to keep distance we need to you know uh, yeah um, and then jumping into the hecticness, um, this image was taken in the in the early stages of lockdown, when um, police were moving through the streets, and um, uh, there was, you know, we were seeing unprecedented uh, violence because people weren't allowed to be there, but um, uh, these people in this picture um, were essentially homeless and they were being pulled from their houses or from their makeshift shelters and and hit with a shambok and like it was it was completely crazy to see um, uh, it was completely crazy to see how police were handling themselves in that stage and like how we were in this unprecedented time and there were the, all these unrepresented people that um, they had no place to go. They essentially, you know, they were, um, essentially they had no place to go. And they were, you know, they had made their lives in the streets and this is all they knew. And uh, very suddenly they were, their whole lives were uprooted. So in the initial stages of lockdown, there were all sorts of questions about uh, morality in the sense that, you know where do where do homeless people go? Do they do they then go into uh, cram into shelters? Uh, being crammed into a shelter is not potentially a good place if you want to fight a virus. So I mean these sort of things came to came to the came to the fore when we were uh, in the in the initial stages of lockdown. I understand that things are a little bit more different now and that movement is not as heavily policed, but um, in terms of the early stages of lockdown, uh, this is these are some of the things I saw: uh, police beating people in the streets with shambox, um, which is uh, completely unacceptable. Um, to draw back, now I'm not going to just show. Um, 
I'm not just going to show pictures of, of violence and chaos, but here was a, a, a beautiful moment that was shared between a, um, a, a member of the SANDF and a, a young girl during, um, it was during the, when, when we first had curfew, uh, when, when the police were, when, when the government was still um, uh, policing a curfew in South Africa. And uh, we did a, um, a, a army ride along with members of the SANDF. And this was a beautiful moment between uh, a young girl who, she actually, um, she was speaking in sign. She, 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 she was, she was deaf. And um, the member of the SANDF here were communicating in sign. And I just thought that uh, it was a, a beautiful soft moment um, because ultimately the people in the uh, the people that are in the SANDF are often uh, spoken about uh, as if they're combatants, but uh, they're actually just people like you and me. Um, and uh, this was just one of those. Uh, it was a gentle moment that I experienced where there was a communication with hands. It wasn't verbal. And uh, between the two of them, they were able to sort of communicate, um, which, which I thought was uh, quite a special moment that, um, that I saw during, during lockdown. Um, in this next picture, um, I'm gonna give a huge shout out to our healthcare workers um, because now more than ever, they need it. Uh, right now, um, as we reach the peak and as we reach um, the sort of the scary moments of this, you know, very scary pandemic that we're facing, um, it's important that we recognize the work that they're doing and we don't forget that, um, that they are working day in and day out. Uh, and this was, this, this was, an, this was a, a portrait of a healthcare worker, a nurse, that I photographed who was testing people. Um, and anyway, I just, I, I, felt, I felt it was important to, important to mention the healthcare workers, uh, especially tonight. And as, as, especially as we all sort of sit here um, in our homes, watching in safe places that we all um, remember and think about the people that are working right now, as we speak, as we sit here, they are working and tomorrow morning when you wake up, they will be working and they'll be continuously be working. So um, a huge shout out to, to uh, anybody in the healthcare sector, anybody who's uh, you know, remotely just monitoring the numbers and, and is involved in um, monitoring and looking after the general public during this like absolutely crazy time. Um, I, I, I decided to include this image because for me, it, it, it is very layered um, and it speaks about how people have accepted the new normal and how it's become almost a, a non-verbal thing that we all remain spatially distanced between ourselves and how we have this, um, how we have this, you know, overriding sort of force that's you know, sort of keeping an eye on us. But um, yeah, so in this picture, I, I just really liked how it is layered and how it speaks about all of the different um, factors of society that are, you know, uh, being involved. This picture was taken at a, um, this picture was taken at a, an address where, uh, at a taxi rank. And um, uh, I think, you know, the, it has been, it is a hot topic. It is uh, still very much a part of the uh, national conversation. So um, yeah, yeah. So this was, this was also during the early stages. Um, and for me, it, it, it just speaks about how people have naturally accepted um, the way forward and naturally accepted that, you know, we can't, we can't be so close together and we need to actually be a little bit careful moving forward. 
This was a uh, uh, this this picture here was taken during raids in Kielbrun, and also it was taken during the hard lockdown where nobody could move anywhere. And it's maybe not the it's not the most technical picture. It's not. It doesn't tell. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that are that can be uh, sort of technically looked at. Um, but what really stood out for me in this picture, and why I'm choosing to show it, is because um, in South Africa it's not that easy for people to to lock down and to stay at home because we have big families and we live in confined spaces and there are places where people um, live with high population density. And in this picture, we can see one, two, three, four, five, you know, five people and whom I'd assume is, is the mom. Um, and that's the, those are just the people that that came out to look out the window. Like uh, I don't I, I I don't personally know the the situation here. I wasn't in a position to ask. Uh, these this family was on the second floor, but um, having look looking at this picture really made me think about isolation in South Africa and how um, we look at our living spaces and how. Um, people during that hard lockdown and even now are forced to sort of um, identify with space and how they are looking at their home environments. Um, yeah. And then lastly, I mean, uh, this, is, this is a picture that I feel um, it could have been taken, this picture could have been taken at any given time um, it's a it's a story that I'm sure most or most journalists have covered, but I feel that it's really important that we that we discuss and think about these images now, because um, this image talks about um, the idea of what uh, the term is the, the term that's being thrown around these days is 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 the shadow pandemic, and how. Um, how a hard lockdown gives the perfect environment for a different kind of malevolent virus to grow. And uh, that malevolent virus is that of domestic violence and um, uh, gender-based yeah, gender uh, violence. So um, when we all are forced into our homes, uh, where, where do you go if, the most, if the most violent uh, presence in your life lives there. Um, and uh, this was part of a uh, independent story that I, that I did, um, where I, I really tried to look at the, the shadow pandemic and how, um, how, the, how the conditions of lockdown were the perfect conditions for a different kind of, of, of atrocity to occur. And um, sort of in closing, I think it's really important that we have these conversations because home is not always a safe place for everybody. Um, home is sometimes you know, home can be um, a, a very dangerous place. And very often uh, police or the government can only intervene when it's absolutely too late. So, um, yeah, so I think, yeah, uh, for, for me, that's why I included this image uh, within, within the this, um, sort of theme of a lockdown. Uh, this lady was, was uh, relocated um, by community intervention. It was by, there, were no, there was no help by NGOs, there was no government intervention. Um, the, uh, this lady essentially reached out for help and was moved by community members. And um, yeah, so I, I, um, yeah, so that is, I feel, is, is such an important, important um, touch, touching point that we that we speak about these things because home is not always a safe place, um, and especially during a lockdown. So that is that is my edit of pictures. Uh, I'm going to. 
stop sharing the screens. Stop. While you're doing that, Alistair, um, I mean, I, I like how you, you are actually capturing the sentiments around the shadow pandemic. I mean, just about two webinars, we actually had um, a webinar, although it didn't have a virtual exhibition, but I mean, this is something we can explore. We actually had a panel of experts, you know, discussing with us uh, the rise of gender-based violence and all sorts of uh, abuse, as you say, in that home is not necessarily a safe space for everybody uh, now that we are being uh, expected to uh, lock down, you know, um, all sorts of things are happening um, in, in some homes. So uh, perhaps this is something we can explore with you guys uh, in future, even if it's later on in the year. But at this point in time as well, I'd like to uh, pose a question to all of you. And um, this question revolves around now as we, we have been made aware that we are in a peak period of, of, of this pandemic. What are your anxieties? What are your fears um, as you expected? to continue to capture this moment and continue to um, tell stories um, through um, your lens. Uh, if I can start with you, Kim. Yeah, thanks Thanks for asking the question. And then Jock and, and Alistair, amazing pictures. Um, yeah, this, this question is interesting because as I was listening to Alistair, I wanted to bring up this very thorny but extremely important topic. Um, what is being done to protect us as frontline media workers. And, you know, it's a topic that, that myself and other photojournalists have all the time, you know, over coffee, um, you know, our safety, our mental um, health, um, you know, our stress levels, you know, what, what, what is being done for us? I mean, are we going to just continue to cover this, you know, as if we sort of robots, um, you know, what protection do we have? Not only PPEs, I mean, but, you know, is there a point at which in our coverage, we can ask our employers, you know, to have two weeks off because, you know, we, we stressed. Um, for instance, um, I, I'm sure it's okay to mention it, but the New York Times has, has a really good solid system in place um, for anyone covering the pandemic to, to be able to see um, a counselor, um, you know, there's there's a system that supports them in their covering of a pandemic. So um, coming back to your question, I think I don't want to get to a point where I don't bring this topic up. You know, I think it needs to be discussed. And I think I'll speak for myself. Um, you know, there's a certain part of me, a photojournalist, who has to be brave and sort of fearless to cover the stories that we cover. But I also want to get to a point in my coverage of the pandemic where I do, I am honest with myself and say, okay, well, this is just too much. I need time out. I need either leave or um, I need some other way to basically recover from what I'm, what I'm doing. And, you know, for instance, next week, I'm going to start working with an undertaker. So, you know, I'm documenting almost the business of the death of Corona. So, yeah, it, it is it is something that I think we all need to discuss openly. I don't think we should be afraid of discussing our mental health. Um, I'm very open and I quite often give lectures about my recovery from PTSD, which was really bad up, you know, from covering civil wars. And, and I think that this discussion is something that we should all continue to have. It's not only about photographers, of course, it's about, we, we all affected by this pandemic. So. Yeah, I think it's it's a discussion that needs to happen. And I think all of our employers should acknowledge that we are not robots, that we are human beings. And, you know, we are taking exceptional risks out there, every, literally every single day. And for me, um, you know, the, the risk level is just getting worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And and as, of course, the, the pandemic itself and the number of um, infected people increases, it's, it's becoming more and more evident and more and more stressful uh, for me. So mental health, I think it's really important for us to openly discuss. Thank you, Kim. Um, Jack, what's your view? How could, what was the question exactly? So the question is now we're entering the peak season of uh, COVID, you know, um, you guys being in the front line of capturing these moments. 
um, for everybody. How, how do you feel in terms of your anxiety level and actually managing um, the risks involved in making sure that you are still able to bring in um, the stories or capture the stories through um, your photos? Okay, yeah, like Kim has said, what Kim suggested we should be doing is uh, implementing like uh, uh, ways for people to get help and so creating sort of a structure for photographers because currently it is very, uh, I also get anxiety from having to go outside and I get anxiety from having to wear a mask all the time and I get stressed like going to where the COVID is because that's what we keep having to do and that's literally our job and we don't have extra measures or extra precautions that is offered to us whatever we do we have to sort of decide for ourselves what it is what measures you're going to be taking uh, today or what are you going to how you're going to treat the situation and we also oftentimes find ourselves in spaces where social distancing for example is hard it's hard to do and you know you, we we we, all, we have to take similar kinds of precautions as people that have to deal with covid patients for example on a regular basis because we kind of might end up doing that as well and at the same time i also get very stressed out that we also could be people carrying it and you know moving it around and that stresses me out as well so i also have family and have kids and i don't want to uh, be the person to bring it but because of my job so yeah I don't know how to fix it or I don't know what would be better, but if there were, if we were talking about it uh, more often and talking about it like we are doing now, um, I think that would that'd be good, a good start. Okay. And Alistair, how, what's your, what's your headspace when it comes to um, these concerns around your, your being in the front line and actually at the same time risking your, your own health uh, in making sure that you are still able to do your job as expected. So, I mean, I think I think Kim and Kim and Jacques pretty much hit the nail on the head there. Um, especially when uh, you know uh, Kim is talking about how. Um, so first, oh wait, firstly, we're in this unprecedented time where there's no there's no guide, there's no rule book, there's no like. Um, you know, we're in this completely unprecedented time. So it creates this immense stress. Um, and I know both Kim and Jacques have families that they need to look after. So now, uh, the, the, in, the, in the past where you go out and you cover a violent protest, um, you would go and cover that violent protest, but you wouldn't bring that violent protest home. You know, you would, you would, you would, you would, uh, log off at the end of the day um, and you'd sort of uh, you'd, you'd realize the, 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 the violent situation that you had come through but this is the first time that we risk bringing it home which, which, which brings a whole um, other plethora of, of questions so I do think it's really important that um, uh, employers come to the fore that they acknowledge the, the danger of the situation, that they're um, sort of uh, proactive, in, uh, proactive in, in looking at the situation. Uh, right now we're heading into peaks, into the, we, in the next two months, we're going to be seeing the, the peak of the virus. So it's super, super important that we, uh, we have the, 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 the most protection that, that we could possibly have. Um, I mean, we, that, that, is, that is one aspect, that is, the, that is one um, completely valid aspect. But we also, we're now dealing with the situation where, because everybody is at home, there's so much in, misinformation flying around um, mm -hmm. and people are sharing information that's not validated. People are sharing things that are very scary, but not true. And um, this creates a uh, even broader uh, global. Uh, um, it, it creates a, a global anxiety that I think affects every single each one of us, uh, whether you're a journalist or not. So I mean, even that we need to we need to sort of we need to 
try and uh, bridge the divide and, 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 and try and get an interest in verified and, and important news rather than just the, the crazy hype that's out there. Um, social media is a, a very scary place at the moment um, because it just, it, 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 it is an information stream of completely unverified information that just sort of flows at you. So, I mean, that, that for one, that for one is a is a big a cause of anxiety for me because the media has never been under so much scrutiny. Uh, we've never been blamed. We've never been blamed for so much. Um, the media, you know, I've, I've never seen the, the, the term the media thrown around so so often. So I mean, I'm just touching on I'm just touching on certain points um, of things that sort of really. Uh, ramp up the um, anxiety when going out in the field. Like if the media is constantly under attack, um, you know, and we're, we're constantly being scrutinized and, and criticized from the general public, um, is the work that we're going out and doing, is it having the effect that we wanted to? Is it informing the people that we wanted to inform? Um, and these are all questions that I think are very important. Uh, yeah, uh, moving forward. Sure. And, 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 and building on to that, uh, um, what you've just said now about uh, is the work that you're doing, you know, um, helping in any way in terms of ensuring that the public stays informed and up to speed. I want to actually ask Kim that uh, in your experience, is the work that the photojournalist is doing, is it as appreciated as uh, just um, a journalist who, who writes stories and not necessarily <laughs> kept uh, read through photos. I'm not necessarily dry, trying to <laughs> yeah. reason, but I mean, I found that with the photo, uh, visual photo exhibitions, there's a much more appreciation for what the photojournalists are doing, as opposed to um, perhaps we haven't been using these platforms well enough to um, elevate the work that the photojournalists are doing. Yeah, look, I mean, such a contentious question and, uh, you know, I'll try and tread lightly. Um, yeah, I, you know, um, sort of three decades after I picked up a camera for the first time, I still really, truly believe in the old cliche, you know, a picture tells a thousand words. Um, so, yeah, it is extremely important and powerful. I think it's a, a mixture of, of both written TV and stills. Um, you know, I think just one thing and well said, Alistair, about this this sort of flow of, of a lot of it useless information on social media. I mean, it's a minefield out there. Um, but back to one reason that I really do honestly wake up most days and still go out there and shoot is because don't forget, we are also documenting a pandemic. So the images that we're shooting for our three respective employees and for ourselves um, are a document. So, you know, in 50 years or 100 years time, um, it's really critical that these images of the lockdown and the pandemic and, you know, unfortunately the impending, um, I wouldn't like to use the word mass funerals, but the increase in the funerals, it's critical that we document these. So, yeah, I mean, I, I really feel that strongly that all of my images on the EPA archive are there for hopefully forever. And, and we are super important in, in documenting, uh, you know, our country's history. And, you know, the, the last pandemic in South Africa in the world actually was, you know, the Spanish flu uh, pandemic, which was, you know, just over 100 years ago. And, you know, I researched it on Google and yes, there are a couple of images of the Spanish flu. But isn't it amazing that we're in a time now where we have this ability with these digital cameras to document this, mm -hmm. this part of our history. So I think we, you know, certainly for myself and I'm sure Alistair and Jacques will agree that, you know, we, we're documenting. This is important to, to get these moments on, on, on camera and here for, for future generations. Thank you, Kim. And um, Jack, um, I'm going to pose a different question to you. I mean, we spoke about the concerns around the reality of now bringing the, vi uh, the virus home with you, um, uh, you know, after, after being out there in the field capturing um, stories. Uh, are you strict in terms of, uh, you know, following the protocols of getting home before you can even give a hug to uh, the loved ones, making sure that you first rush off to have a shower or a bath, and then only then after you've had a change of clothes as well, 
you come back and you can um, then be able to mix with them? Um, no, I don't do that. Uh, I don't take a bath every time I get home. Um, but I'm also not around people all that much. Um, uh, I do sort of, I'm isolated from most of my family. And um, so I don't, uh, have to interact with them that much. I don't take extra precautions to the extent of taking a bath or a shower every time I get home. But what I do do is I do wear, always wear a mask. I do sanitize. I do wash my masks. Um, my key thing is uh, to never, ever touch anything ever. I only ever hold my camera. You'll see me like always holding my camera. And I only hold my camera and I won't touch things. And obviously I know now we know that the, the virus... Uh, sort of airborne and mm -hmm. you can still inhale these things and what i've been doing is i've just been being extra cautious the other day uh, i went to the trona district hospital where they showed us like these tents that they'd set up outside and we went in there to shoot pictures uh or well we weren't supposed to go inside but we shoot, shot pictures from the outside the tents or into the tents and that stressed me out to the point that when they were off to go to a press briefing i left i was like nah i'm done I'm not going to be hanging out uh, at this hospital any longer. And I wanted to just get clean and washed. So, um, but uh, yeah, the, the precautions I take are the precautions, I guess, uh, not as much as uh, someone from like the medical uh, field would have to do coming home. Um, yeah. All right. And Alistair, a question that came through, which I'm going to pose to you is, are you finding that, um, is, are there issues with gaining access as a photojournalist to some spaces, especially <laughs> now during this COVID period? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a pressing issue with any journalist. I think uh, getting access is essentially your hardest part of any, um, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it, it, is, it, it is difficult. Um, having you know having press cred credentials now it doesn't it doesn't make you exempt from catching disease or spreading disease so we need to be very careful of that but um uh, access is the one thing that as journalists we work hard with um building contacts with um building relationships mm -hmm. and uh, sort of opening those doors it's it's the one thing that uh, i think is is always a challenge whether we're in a pandemic or not uh so yeah i mean uh, access uh, in a broader in a broader sense is always um is always your biggest hurdle it is always your first um door that you need to knock on it is always the first thing and and the day that you can phone your editor and be like how's it i have access is the day that you start doing the proper work so i think uh, uh yeah re regardless of uh, whether we're in a pandemic or not but um so yeah access uh, and in terms of now with the pandemic um it, it has tightened the screws a bit um it has made it a, a, a quite difficult to get into spaces because uh, if you go into spaces where you contract coronavirus or if you go into spaces where you are potentially going to get sick you're going to transmit it because you as a journalist you meet a lot of people for brief moments in the week that sort of stuff. So I think it, 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 it opens the doors to a lot of potential questions that, that, mm -hmm. that um, yeah, that we need to all think about and be careful of. Uh, so even if you do have access in some situations, um, it's important that you're super careful and that you're not um, working as a transmitter to a flu-like virus, if you get what I'm saying. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm just going to wrap up. I'm mindful of um, your time. Um, starting with Kim, and actually here's the, the compliment um, on, on the work that all of you have showcased tonight. And the, uh, the person who wrote the compliment actually went on to say that they are hoping that the government in their awareness campaign uh, as we enter a much more dangerous period 
they are hoping that government can actually tap into some of the images that you guys have shared, you know, to try and um, um, elevate their efforts of um, um, really intensifying their messaging around, you know, that it is in our hands, um, 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 message directed to each citizen. So I'm going to give you an opportunity, each one of you, to just um, um, uh, say a few uh, closing remarks, but also share with uh, everybody else where they can get hold of, of your work. Okay, you. well, thanks. Yeah, thanks again uh, for hosting me and uh, good to see Jacques and Alistair and everyone who's listening. Um, yeah, just, you know, be safe out there, take it very seriously. Um, that's one thing I, I know from being on the front line. It's not a joke and it's going to get worse. But at the end of the day, we'll get through it. And um, it's a massive challenge for all of us, but um, we'll survive. And uh, thanks for having me. And yeah, you can get me at Kim Ladbrook on Instagram. And my website's also kimladbrook.com. So thanks a lot. And um, uh, see you all later. Um, Thank you, Kim. Um, Jack, over to you. Um, yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank Kim you. and Alistair. Thanks, guys. It's nice to see you guys around. Every time I see you guys, it's nice to see you guys. Um, and yeah, thank you for giving us this opportunity to do this. Um, I think it's good that we can talk about this. And it's nice to be able to show people and let them know and talk about it. And thanks for everyone who, uh, who, who came through. Um, and uh, stay safe, guys. Uh, it's good to... It's, it's good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And Alistair, over to you. Um, yes. Yeah. I, I, yeah. It, it, this is a this is a great platform. Thank you so much. I think uh, as we move forward um, into the sort of into the storm, as uh, our president mentioned, as we move forward into this sort of cloudy, scary time that we all just remember why we have taken the sacrifices that that we have done and that we keep that in mind and that we be safe and we look after each other and that we're there for each other because that's that's super super important uh hardship hardship um brings out best the both the both brings out best the it brings both the best and the worst <laughs> and uh let's just let's just try and, and be on the better side of 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 that struggle because the, the, we all we're all facing the scary time so sending love to sending love to everybody in the industry sending love to everybody who's watching let's be safe let's look after ourselves let's look after our families and uh yeah um, Kim, Jack, and Alistair, thank you so much um, for taking us into your world um, of how you are telling your stories uh, through the images that you continue to capture during this dangerous and challenging period of COVID-19. We really appreciate it. We thank hope you. that we continue uh, on this power, um, um, uh, partnership with Street. Uh, I mean, uh, we all know that power storytelling uh, can only be enhanced through um, images. Um, so in, in wrapping up, I want to uh, also thank uh, Emmanuel, who continues to link us up uh, with the photojournalist um, from that affiliated to Street, uh, uh, Street Echo, what uh, some of you have shared earlier. We also want to send a shout out to the healthcare workers and all our fellow um, uh, colleagues in, in the media fraternity who are out there capturing stories and making sure that everyone continues to be informed. Um, as the National Press Club, um, we also want to use this opportunity to echo what the president has said that we are entering into a rather stormy period and everybody needs to do their bit to ensure that uh, we survive this period. Um, so I invite uh, you guys, as well as everybody who's in the media and uh, the PR space, to um, register with the National Press Club to be our members. Uh, we do have these webinars almost on, on a weekly basis. We tackle different uh, issues. Uh, we've even tackled the, the mental health side of uh, being a media professional. Once again, thank you for your time and uh, sharing your knowledge and insight with us and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you for having us. Ciao.